After World War I is when my dad went to America. His uncle had a bakery, and so he learned how to become a baker. He was in love with a young girl in Germany, so he left it when he was 18 years old to go to America. When he was 21, he came back to get my mom, and they married, and he took her back to the United States. When they had the reunion that all the kids came home to my grandma and they got paid and then it was the time to leave again to go back to America. Hitler did not let any money go out of Germany. They would not let any property or money leave Germany. The Nazis kept everything. They didn't want anybody to transfer any money out to other countries. So my dad was faced with it. What do you do? So he decided to stay in Germany and buy a business. In 1939, my first day in school is when the war started. And uh, I, I was a child. I didn't really understood too much about war at that time. But the, the change in the first year in, a, in Germany was people got issued stamps, they only get that much food, you know, on stamps, they couldn't get by more. Um, people were, uh, you know, called into the war, didn't want to go to the war, but they had to go. So, um, a lot of things, just when I was a child, I saw the changes that happened. I didn't quite understand at that time. There were a lot of changes that happened, but it wasn't impacting me at that time so much till they started bombing. The war became very, very, very awful for me as a child is when we had the first bombing in Hamburg. That first night when the bombing came down, we had over 100,000 people killed and the town was really you know, but almost, uh, you know, destroyed. That's when it realized sank in, but that was nothing. This was the first night. We lived close to the Baltic Sea, and when all the big factories that were produced for producing war uh, was right in Rostock, in Hamburg, Rostock, Pennemünde. In Pennemünde is where they made the rockets to shoot to England. So all of this area, was where they would come every night and bomb to destroy the area there. But the side effect of bombing is, uh, in the beginning, the German Air Force was trying to shoot down these uh, bombers. And these bombers came down, and this is when I saw the horror, horror. I mean, I had to witness an American plane coming down, the pilots and arm their head there. But that's when it impacted me how horrible war is. And when I saw all those refugees coming from the towns that were destroyed with very big injuries, and most of them are dead, um, that's when uh, it affected us. In Dresden, where my relatives live, overnight they killed 500,000 people and destroyed Dresden. You know what I mean? Um, the, the, the gruesome part that people were just wiped out, whole streets were wiped out, they had nothing to do with the war. They were innocent women and children because the men were in the war. And the war was not only fought by the front, it was fought to, de to destroy uh, the morale and the life of Germans, period, you know. The, the, the thing that I think we 
sometimes forget that the Germans were so much victims than anybody else. Because there were so many bombs come down, my mother decided uh, with help to build a bunker. And it was very deep in the ground with straw things and all that. She, they, they created a bunker. And a bunker was there not for, if a bomb came down, no problem. But all the debris that was really produced when bombs came down someplace else, the airplane came down, the debris is all over the place. That's what people got hurt more than sometimes just from the bombs. So every night when, or every other night when those bombs came, the sirens went on and my mother said, get your coat, we're going to the bunker. And so that one night after I saw all the dead people and I saw all this, I had a nervous breakdown. I said to my mom, I'm not going anymore. I want to die. I will not go anymore. I want to be here and I want to die. Everybody else dies, I want to die too. I couldn't bear any more the pain of what I did see that day. I think one of the propaganda that Hitler put out is what we're supposed to be hearing. You know, I mean, that they were the enemy. I think it was because of, of Pearl Harbor and um, that they were more intense to get all the people going, uh, uh, you know, fighting the war. And being with Japan, I, I, we heard that we were connected to be having a friend in Japan. When I'm saying this, this is a child talking. I mean, I'm not talking about that's what we found out, just like to understand what's going on in the world and, and Japan is fighting also and uh, whatever. Uh, so they, they went back to this um, uh, fighting and wanting to have more leadership in the world, I think. You know, it's, it was really what they really said is we want to get more of the world belong to us, this kind of thing. Now this is what they really portrayed in their propaganda, and that's what we picked up. Did it make sense at this time? No. That to me, no, to nobody else. But that's how it was. And your dear didn't question what happened. All the things that were going on, Nobody believes that. He says, why did German people didn't know all this was going on? Well, nobody opened up their mouth. Even if they would know, they wouldn't have said a thing. They wouldn't have said a thing because they would have been on the train next, you know? So this is, was the problem of fear that you wouldn't say anything that wasn't right because you were worried that you get on that train. Mm -hmm. We didn't have television to begin with. There was no television. And the radio station, you were not permitted to watch anything. They only had one station, but they were not, not everybody had a radio. And so you did not get any outside information. Now, my mother, they had one that you could get an outside station. And I remember she, she took the curtains down and she covered this because if they would catch you to, to have another station, you go to a concentration camp. So, you know, so I remember my mother said, I have to hear what's going on in the world. And she would cover everything up and she would cover a blanket over and they were going with their head. So nobody could hear that they were listening to other stations. But uh, that was the one that uh, was very strict. They didn't want German people to know anything than just what they told, were told, you know. We didn't have any teachers. And the one teacher, and when we had two, they had to teach all the kids, all grades. So what they did is they put like three, four uh, grades together in one room and did the best they could, you know, for, for what they teach. And some of the high school kids had to teach the little ones. When there was really a big um, bombing that day, then there was no school because, you know, things were just in a disarray. Education was really put on, uh, on a waiting list, so to speak, because there was just no help and there was really a lot of hardship and education was very spotty. You know, for Christmas, we had, we had a tree 
and we baked little cookies from the syrup and everything, and the cookies were cut, and then we put them on the Christmas tree. But there were really no presents to give. So uh, I, one Christmas, I got a doll. Now, I could not imagine how happy I was then because there were no dolls, there were no toys, and so I got a doll. That was unbelievable. I had a doll. And I mean, it was the biggest presence I ever got. A young girl wants a doll, you know, and I got a doll. Now, my mother probably treated it for butter or something like this because it was a trade probably. They were not on the store, so she got me a doll. Part of the hardship about having war is because nobody could get to buy anything anymore. And everything was on stamps. So it was very limited what people had. So um, all, of, all the kids, because all the men went to the war, all the kids had to work. Everyone had to work. I mean, on the farms or whatever work had to be done. They had to take over working. And many um, vacations in the school were geared to if the harvest of the potatoes were, they all, the kids could all go for a week or two pick potatoes, or that if there was any kind of crop, they would get off for a week to help because there was not enough labor to do the work, including me. Uh, so we worked and did everything. We learned so many things because we just had to learn how to do it. When we were not in school, we worked. You know, the, the animals had to be taken care of. Uh, they had to be fed. Um, we, we did all the work that needed to be done by men before, but the men weren't there. So every, and that wasn't easy. I want to tell you, the kids really didn't want to do it. We had to work on the field. You see these long fields of sugar beets? We had to go, and we had to, first of all, we had to walk the horse, so he would, you know, in the middle of the, of the between the rows. Then we had to separate them. You only want one red beet, and then the next one here, so they get big enough. So you had to go, and then when you, when you sold them, there's four or five all the time. So you had to pull them out. I, went, I remember I had pats on my knees, and we were going on the knees, all the kids, and they had to pull the other ones out, so you only had every so far. You had one plant, because you know, then they could grow. We had to do this for weeks. So we worked all the time. I only know work. All I did ever was work, and that's still like, you know, when I grew up, all I know is work. I always get busy because I know working. The other segment of my life that I never will forget, the war came, the Russians came closer, and the Americans were here, and then they pressed the war. And the war stopped where we were. That's where the war ended, right where we lived. You know, they pressed enough and they pressed enough, so that was the end of the war where we were. Along the line, there were thousands of refugees. They were fleeing from the war. They you know, didn't want to be killed and were pushed back. So where we lived, we had hundreds in our area, but thousands in our village. People homeless, shelterless, because they're running for their life. So my mother, and nobody, there was no food. The, the businesses closed all down. They didn't have anything, but there was no facilities anymore. So my mother set up, you know, we had a wash kitchen. Uh, that's what in the old days people cooked the clothes. They didn't really wash like we're doing with wash machines now. She had this big wash kettle and we had milk and we had eggs. So all day and all night people helped. We cooked milk soup and we feed we fed hundreds and hundreds of people because there was no food. There were the kids, there were the people and that, we fed so many people. And then, they are, then everything that was going on is just keeping people alive there. And they were sleeping everywhere. We had straw, straw in, the, in the school on the floors. We had straw in our house. They were sleeping everywhere. So uh, this time was bad. But then the war was over, and the next part was even worse. After the war, 
uh, since we were listed, I was listed on the American consulate, they sent the first care pack package to me. That was the first pack package I opened up that was chocolate in it, there was gum in it, and there was stuff in it that I had not seen growing up. And I was, I was having this piece of chocolate, everybody, my brother got some, I got some. And I was licking a little bit on it and then I saved it. And I licked every day a little bit on it and then I saved it. There was no announcement. The track, the Panzers, you know, the big tanks came faster down and the shooting was coming like crazy and we were all hovering everywhere and it would close and we'd once it stopped. We only knew the war was over when the Mongols, the army came in with big noise and came and raped everybody they could get and plundered everything. They plundered all the houses because their commander told them they have 10 days to do anything with the Germans they wanted to. Well, who they were, they were women and children. They raped every woman they could see, even nuns. They raped, raped everything. My mother hit me. He, she was hiding me for a long period of time. And she, not an old woman herself, in order to feed and get around, she had a big coat on and she put cow manure all over her because they wouldn't touch that. And she could move around and still, you know, function, giving me food where I was hiding and doing things all the way around to make it work, everything yet. And so this was going on for two weeks, very hostile. Then the commander gave them orders not to do this anymore, but they didn't stop for some time. We slept at night by our, with our neighbors. Um, their grandfather, their opa, was building a hideaway for the women. And the women from the village, the young girls, were all there because he would hide them. When they come, you know, after the two weeks, he would put them away there. And there was a big hay thing, a big hay barn. And he made a hole in it inside, it was empty. And then he built a long walkway. You know why? When the Russians came, they had these big barnets. They would go everywhere to see if people are there or if they find something, you know, they found a lot of jewelry this way that was hitting, they would have these things. So he made it far enough away if he was going to look for, they were looking for it, they couldn't hurt us. And that's where we would be at nights. So one night things calmed down and we didn't go there and they came. So Opa, Opa says, what do we do? They had these big lights shining up wanting to break in. He took their little, they had a liquor telephone. You know, they had no telephone service at that time. But that liquor telephone looked like a regular telephone. I mean, you know, I dials on it on a hill. So he went there in the window and dialed, Commandante, Commandante, he said. And then he dialed on Commandante really loud so they could hear it. And they took off because they knew they're not supposed to be doing this anymore, you know. But that was the story. It was, uh, he saved all of us, all the girls on us, because he, he made sure they wouldn't come in all in masses doing the same thing over again, you know. My grandfather has a big farm right on the Pena River. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful setting. And uh, the, the young ladies in the city came to stay there when the war was coming closer. He, they were staying there, you know, they had a lot of buildings and everything. They would hide there because they, they didn't want to get hurt in the war with bombs and shooting everything. So when the Russians came, they found that farm. And there were at least 12 girls, 10 to 12 girls there, young girls. And these Mongols, you know, Mongols are people, they have been in the army all their life and they're just fighting. So they came in, they tied these girls on the fest post, bed post, and raped them and raped them and raped them. When they finally left, my grandpa, my old grandpa, cut them off and 10 of them cut their wrist and died, killed themselves. They did unbelievably bad thing to young girls, I mean, there. Yeah. And that happened in my grandpa's house. I mean, these were the things that were gruesome, gruesome what they did, yeah. So anyhow, that was the worst. I mean, the war with bombs was bad, but this was, that was even worse.
I had nightmares for a long, long, long time uh, because we would be every night somebody was listening if the truck would come with, with them yet even after, you know, the first period. And you would watch if they were coming so you would save yourself. The, the community was in ruin. So when they finally, after all this was going on, about four weeks, they had one commander, so to speak, trying to put some rules down. I mean, not really rules, but bringing a little bit something order in there. And so then um, they started the school. One of the things they were teaching about, Nazi is over, and we're now having the best system in the world, which is communism. And the communism will make sure, all of you don't own anything right now, because we're all the refugee kids. We will own everything. There will be no more capitalism in this country. And Saramaya, which my father, he will not be anymore the owner. We will be the owner of this business. Because he has people working for him, and that means a capitalist. He makes money to people's work. And we don't tolerate that in communism. All of us own everything. They did come to my father and they said, you have to turn over your businesses and everything because we will not allow any capitalism in our system. We are communist, we are social party, and the people own everything. So he was putting a notice, but he did not give it up. At night, <clears throat> that's the story, and that really the bad story. At night, a lady called, and she said, Mr. Herr Sattelmeier, you on the list to be picked up with your family. So he said, you need to go, because the reason I called, my husband would really, really, absolutely be angry at me, because you fed, your wife fed me for months with my children when I was, you know, homeless and we didn't have anything to eat. I could not sleep to think that you people, all of you have to go to a camp and be done with for life. So she called and we escaped. We had, um, we had a, really a connection to the mayor because you could not leave your residence not more than 30 miles around your home. So you need a certificate that you could go further away than just from that home. So this mayor, which was our friend, gave us a certificate that we could go through Berlin to Dresden, and we had relatives at Dresden. And so we went that night, and we went to Berlin, and we jumped the train and then stopped outside of Berlin. And then we walked to see a U-Bahn. You know, U-Bahn is a connection with the West. We, we, we finally got, but we could not be going in one train because the Russians would be going along the trains and, and observe everything so nobody would escape from East Germany to West. So uh, we went into, and we made it, I'm making it short, we made it. We went to West Berlin. Um, I, I have said that sentence many times. Overnight, we were homeless, jobless, and poor overnight. The scary part was, we didn't, un nobody understood all this killing that was going on. We really didn't, you know, everybody, my, my mother lost two of her brothers in the war, my father lost his brother in the war. There was so much grief, but it was like, did you ever know when a train goes and you can't stop him? This was going on and nobody could do anything about it. It's like. This is what's happening, but how do you stop? You cannot say a word because you become also one of the people that goes away because that's how powerful the fear was in people. We all just went along. It's like you're on the train and you're just going along. You don't stop that train. That's how this whole situation in my as a child was. There was nothing you could do about it. It changed my life at those of others because people gave up everything to survive this war and, and their life changed forever because they lost 
many of their loved ones, they lost their homes, they lost everything. So the, the, the war was like changing everybody's life. I think nobody worried about the outcome of the war. You know why? They knew this had to come to an end. No, nobody can go and get, take over the world.